if school cost you nothing and you had all the time in the world, and maybe if you didn't have any term papers to write, have you ever felt like you'd just choose to stay in class forever? Maybe you'd dabble in one thing one month and then you'd move on to something else that sparked your curiosity the next month. First, you'd explore quantum mechanics, then you'd wander over into human-centered design, you'd follow that up with some poetry, and then pick up a course on all the ancient mystics, jumping from shamanism to Buddhism, only to follow it with a summer of travel, immersing yourself in breathwork, and improving your emotional intelligence. Wouldn't that be the most amazing life? Actually, don't you just wish that school were like this in general? Don't you wish you could just branch out across lots of different disciplines and traditions, learning bits of wisdom from all of them, only focusing on one thing for as long as it compelled you? I mean, maybe not. I don't think everyone is like this, but I definitely am. My name is Brandy. Welcome to This Plus That. It's a show about connecting the seemingly unconnectable and why it matters. And because I'm someone who would love to spend a lifetime in class, having incredible discussions, learning about new things, and drawing connections between all of them, it makes total sense that I created this podcast, but also that I wound up auditing a class by today's guest, Lincoln Carr, whose course subjects followed much of this exact trajectory, from silence to quantum physics to breath work and so much more. Lincoln is a professor of quantum physics at the Colorado School of Mines and a Jefferson Science Fellow of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Between the songs of sperm whales hunting deep canyons under the seas and the roving eye of the lucid dreamer lying prone in his bed, poetry and physics meet. In this multiverse of possibility, he writes quantum thoughts to a reflection of himself reborn again and again through inner and outer space-time each choice and each moment another universe. He believes that one day, the science we know now will seem like alchemy, and will wonder how we didn't fuse poetry and equations as naturally as the savants of that future age. And he hopes his work presents a moment on the path to that future embrace. And honestly, only a poet would write a bio like that. <laughs> but in today's conversation with him, we go into perhaps a small window into that future possible world. I talk with him about the intersections of quantum logic plus exclusive truth, but you guessed it, we spend plenty of time drawing connections to other things like sexuality and poetry and city planning, and I think you're going to find it fascinating. You'll also hear us talk about the many ways to think differently and how both specialists and synthesis are necessary, how those synthesis seem to change careers frequently, Details about Lincoln's amazing class and how his math and engineering students are such brilliant writers and creatives. Judaism, religion, and how science can become a religion. How poetry plays a role in the sciences. How Lincoln thought in quantum logic before he even knew what it was. The role that dreaming and exploring the liminal plays in Lincoln's work, including how he sometimes dreams as though he is math and finding your place in the world. A couple small notes before we hop into this conversation. Please know that because Lincoln is employed by them, it's important to note that any opinions stated in our conversation or the conclusions that I draw in response do not represent the Department of State. <laughs> and there's a moment where Lincoln says something about how Newton wouldn't have happened without someone named Tycho Bry, And I kind of nod and say, right, in agreement, like I knew who Tycho Bry was. <sighs> Listener, let me tell you. I did not know who Tycho Bry was. <laughs> and I think it's important sometimes to admit, especially in conversation with really smart people, that we don't always know everything because it's okay not to know everything, but it is really fun to dive into their brains. So here's our interview on the intersections of quantum logic plus exclusive truth. Enjoy. There's a passage I would love to read. I sent it to you actually in an email, you and Tony left in, your colleague, months ago, probably a year and a half ago, who knows. I think the subject line was something like, science proving that art needs science, or something <laughs> to that effect. But it's, it's a quote from a book by Dave, David Epstein, who wrote Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. 
And do you mind if I read it? Because I feel like it Please. actually sets up the tone of our conversation and why why we're both so into this sort of thing. Okay. So bear with me. It's a, it's a little bit lengthy, but I feel like it's it's meaningful. Scientists and members of the general public are about equally likely to have artistic hobbies, but scientists inducted into the highest national academies are much more likely to have avocations outside of their vocation. And those who have won the Nobel Prize are more likely still. Compared to other scientists, Nobel laureates are at least 22 times more likely to partake as an amateur actor, dancer, magician, or other type of performer. Nationally recognized scientists are much more likely than other scientists to be musicians, sculptors, painters, printmakers, woodworkers, mechanics, electronics tinkerers, glassblowers, poets, or writers of both fiction and nonfiction. And again, Nobel laureates are far, far more likely still. The most successful experts also belong to the wider world. Quote, to him who observes from afar, said Spanish Nobel laureate Santiago Ramon y Cajal, the father of modern neuroscience, it appears as though they're scattering and dissipating energies, while in reality, they're channeling and strengthening them. The main conclusion of work that took years of studying scientists and engineers, all of whom were regarded by peers as true technical experts, was that those who did not make a creative contribution to their field lacked aesthetic interests outside of their narrow area. As psychologist and prominent creativity researcher Dean Keith Simonton observed, rather than obsessively focusing on a narrow topic, creative achievers tend to have broad interests. This breadth often supports insights that cannot be attributed to domain-specific expertise alone. And I probably want to say too that Reward is not the point, right? I think a lot of this is talking about how successful folks tend to be or how awarded they tend to be or recognized, right? Who seem to cross domains, but mm -hmm. that's not really the point of what we're doing. But I do think it is an interesting study or note about how so many of the folks who do cross boundaries between different disciplines tend to often be ones that are making pretty large achievements. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great correlation. It has been my experience. I've, I've known many Nobel Prize winners, and uh, that is typically true, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, there are only so many Nobel Prizes, so you can say the Nobel Prize worthy people, and then it's a much larger list, and also true in my experience, anecdotally, yeah. But tell me then, for, for, for me as a refresher and for anyone listening, what you do in the world, how that relates, and what you're up to here at School of Mines in Colorado. Sure. Well, how I felt about that quote is that mm, there are different kinds of thinkers and uh, there are the thinkers that uh, have a narrow specialty and they're absolutely key to getting science and engineering and mathematics done. And then there are people that put those ideas together and those are the synthesists. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm one of those. Uh, and, you know, we don't need all synthesis, but we need some. And so synthesis, you know, take uh, everyone's discoveries and put them together in new ways. And for example, something that I that I did is I took the same kinds of measures that are used in EEG and fMRI on brain states, and I used them on quantum states, and I discovered a new kind of quantum state. So that's hmm. sewing together, you know, neuroscience, medical neuroscience, and you know, quantum computing, right? So right. people don't usually do that, right? That's a very odd science fiction sort of thing to do, sure. but it, it worked great. And it's been, been really effective and uh, it brought a whole new tool for understanding, a, you know, an incredibly hard problem on the leading wave of quantum technology. So that is the sort of thing that I do in the sciences. And I think it's a, it's natural to then, you know, as you mentioned with all these people that are sort of no more prize worthy, et cetera, um, uh, it's natural to reach out into other areas, partly through curiosity, partly through just busyness of mind, and partly just the aesthetics, the pleasure of it. Right, like a, a bit of a break for your brain, which is more typically working on something as your day job that maybe wants something else as an outlet to do outside of that. So for example, every morning when I go to the cafe, pre-pandemic of course, right. uh, for oh, 20 years, uh, I read philosophy, I read poetry, I do some reflection and writing. Uh, it's, I suppose, journaling, but not this is what I did today, dear diary. It's more like, here's what I'm thinking philosophically about the world. Right. And that warms me up then to then do quantum physics or complexity science. Mm. And then I often close my, my evening with story, something to really set the tone for dreams. And I do a lot of work in my dreams as well. And so, you know, it, there are different kinds of thinking that I engage in and different sorts of thinking that lead to synthesis throughout the day. And there's a kind of rhythm to that, you know, just like your circadian rhythm. 
right. Circadian, I should say. Were you always like this as a kid, though? Like, when did, when did all this curiosity start? And, and <laughs> I was how? always like this. <laughs> <laughs> Were you always this kind of human? <laughs> uh, I, I had an unusual degree of freedom as a small child, probably partly that my mother was very much a hippie and uh, also partly um, just that I was a pretty responsible kid. Uh, and also my parents were fairly hands off. And so, um, you know, I do things like get on a bus, you know, at eight years old and living in DC, go to the Smithsonian and spend my day thinking about insects or, uh, paleontology, you know, or I don't know that rockets or some kind of art. Um, and then I would go and do my schoolwork and be inventing mathematics and, you know, those kinds of things together were things that I naturally was doing from a young age. Nobody really made me do those things. I was just very curious. Right. Your parents. Your parents weren't forcing it on you, but you naturally had a sense of curiosity. And they did give me a lot of support in doing those sorts of things. You know, in terms of my personal spiritual explorations, my you know, mother came from a Catholic family and my father came from a Jewish family. They both sort of left those things behind. But I was personally very interested in spirituality from probably age four. You know, I they very kindly took me to anywhere I wanted to go. It didn't matter if it was a synagogue, you know, or it was, I don't know, a gathering of Hare Krishnas, uh, anything. They'd be happy to do that. And that, that really started my philosophical thinking in my life. So they were very supportive in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the note about spirituality because I do think there's a lot of folks that I know who do, who are asking a lot of these questions, very both, I guess, scientific art, philosophical sorts of things. And mm -hmm. I, I think especially folks who tend to be philosophical in nature are ones who from an early age tend to be some sort of seeker, right? Like there's some sort of innate, like deep search for question, like just questions that won't go away that you sort of live out the rest of your life pursuing in some way, right? But they, they tend to be kind of spiritual leaning or philosophical in nature. I was telling you a little bit before we started recording that I, you know, I grew up in Dallas in the South in the Bible Belt and I experienced a, a, a lot of that culturally, but wasn't necessarily imbued with that specifically from my parents, but was sort of constantly seeking, you know, like you, whether it was poetry or uh, church in some way or philosophical texts or whatever that might be, that there was always this internal drive to ask questions that I think physics and the sciences do such a great job of asking, which is why are we here? How do we get here? What does it m matter? And what does it mean for our daily lives sorts of things? My favorite example of this in one of these synthetic uh, thinkers or synthesis type thinkers is uh, Schrodinger. Mm -hmm. So uh, after, you know, the ben, cat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Schrodinger's cat. Right. After inventing, you know, quantum mechanics from scratch, along with a few other people, he started thinking about what is life. And he wrote a very nice book on it. And in it, he, he posits the existence of a molecule of life. And this eventually becomes, you know, the search for DNA. So that starts with one of these synthesis type thinkers, right. you know, really crossing lines. And he was also poly in a time when, you know, that was just totally uh, unacceptable. And, you know, he uh, chose that lifestyle over being in a famous university and that kind of saved him from World War II. So you, you never know <laughs> how your radical decisions, whether they're ways of living or ways of thinking, you know, well, you never know how, how they'll turn out. But in general, I think they, they take us to better places, often surprising places. And that has been the story, very much the story of my life. Yeah. Going to surprising places with my thinking, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, of course, for me personally, gender and sexuality always cross over with us, too, because I think those tend right. to be places where, of course, I explore what it is to cross boundaries that are generally more accepted or standard. Right. But that those the, the questions don't stop at my work, you know, so right. they bleed over into everything else, too. And so I feel like a human who's sort of constantly asking, how can I think in this other way or take something I've learned in this other area and apply it to something else? And for me, that, of course, applies relationally and whether it's romantic or not. But yeah, I do think it's really interesting to me, too, because I think a lot of folks I find even historically that you don't necessarily hear those stories you find that that they do tend to be queer or poly or you know a, a lot of folks do but yeah I think I think that's really interesting I hadn't heard that about Schrodinger oh yeah it's a famous example <laughs> so cool okay so 
I don't actually think that you know how I wound up in your class. So yeah, how how did you wind up there? Because you were a great participant a, and uh, a silent because <laughs> you know I was auditing the class, but a silent yeah. one nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's sort sort of a funny story, which is uh, speaking of gender and sexuality. I I had followed a lady I had a crush on to a party, a house party. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I feel like how every, you know, how every story should start. Yeah. But I wind up at this party. She ignores me entirely, almost. But I, being the sort of social, you know, I'm going to stay here and find a way to chat with interesting people kind of person. And because I'm the kind of person that I joke at, a, at any party, you can usually find me somewhere standing near the snacks talking about something like, racial justice or the meaning of life, right? Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what happened at this party. So I'm out on the porch on the front patio and I have no idea how we started the conversation, but I end up talking to a total stranger about the nature of time for two hours, probably more than two hours. And her name was Lauren Rains. Oh, and, <laughs> right. Exactly. And Lauren, so we connected there of course, over these like metaphysical conversations. And then I think she found me on Facebook at the time. And like two months later, reaches out to me over Facebook Messenger and says, hey, Brandy, I'm going to audit this class at the School of Mines. I think you would really dig it. He, you should meet Lincoln Carr. And sure enough, of course, I end up reaching out to you mm -hmm. and I end up, you know, coming to audit the class. And so the name of the class was... Explorations in Science, Technology, and Society, Pathways to Innovation, Building Synergy Between the Sciences and Humanities, which I feel like is rightfully a long title for people who are really interested in 100 things. <laughs> <laughs> I always laugh about that. And, and classes were on things like silence, quantum logic, dreaming and the liminal, breath work, poetic reverie, space time, and emotional intelligence. And all of the students are here at the School of Minds, of course, so they're largely math and engineering students. Yes. So tell me, tell me every, I really just want to know everything about how this class came to be, how you wound up teaching this class, those sorts of things. But yeah, let's, let's launch in there because the class itself was just, I feel like for me, winding up in that seat I, I bring the class up all the time because it was so meaningful to me to see folks who were trying to teach others how to do this sort of cross-discipline work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the way the class happened is uh, we have an honors program at Mines, and an honors program is a liberal arts program inside of a STEM program in our case. Right, yeah. which I still, I just think in, it, in and of itself is fascinating. Yeah. A humanities program buried inside of a STEM well, program. Well, you know, about 10 to 20% of students actually want an experience that's well beyond what engineering has to offer. Some of them do humanitarian engineering, and we have like a really prominent humanitarian engineering program here at Mines. Some of them do things like an honors program where they have an international experience or some other signature key experience and then supporting courses like this. And so these are the kinds of people that will make major inventions, you know, will do startups. They're the kinds of people that do this kind of synthesis thinking. And they come from every department across campus, very competitive program and hard to get into. And it's not about having the highest grades. Hmm. It's about having the ability to appreciate and think in different ways. That's ultimately what it's about. Are these all freshmen? Do they come from all four classes? And how, how is it that they find their way into the class yeah. if it's not grades? Yeah, so, so the class is, is part of what's called the McBride Honors Program after Guy T. McBride, who started this. And uh, so the honors program is something that you get into normally in your freshman year. So you apply for it. If you get into it, it's like getting to a university inside of a university. Mm. And once you get into it, you have a cohort that you move with through all four years. So I have mostly juniors and some seniors in my okay. class. So it's upper division course. And they have quite a lot of preparation. They're quite good writers. Um, they are, you know, well beyond uh, the average STEM student and really on par with a liberal arts student in an excellent liberal arts environment, you know, Brown, something like that. Mm. Or small, excellent, like Reed, that kind of thing. Sure. And so uh, they're, it's, it's really my honor to teach students like that. And so the reason that I signed up for the program is I wanted to spend more time with people like that. I felt that I could offer them something from my own story. And that's what that class is about. It's really a, my own story, but providing right. that to students in a way that they, they could take in and, and either accept or reject as they wish. But it, it's just a chance to learn that way of thinking. And so it starts actually with a set of kinds of intelligence. And, the, and this comes from a philosopher friend of mine 
who, <laughs> after the fall of the Soviet Union, reinvented the K-12 system for all the, the satellite states around Russia. And so what he did is he went to every country in the world and went to especially high school in every country in the world and looked at the kind of teaching they did. And out of this, he developed a philosophy of education, um, which is used still in the satellite states and even Russia today. There's over 140 kinds of intelligence he lists. And so what I have students do is I have them mark off the ones that they think they're particularly good at. And usually mm -hmm. that's about 10. And then I say, okay, now we're going to work on at least 10 more out of the 140. We're not going to do the other 134 or whatever it is. Right. Last I thought, I, th I think it was up to 146 recently. <laughs> so they keep growing, you know. And the, the idea is that there are so many cognitive skills, you know, an IQ test is so limited in representing what we do. It captures a few of those abilities. Right. So in a class like this, you have the opportunity to develop, for example, dream thinking, which would be one, to, one of his kinds of intelligence. And there are many kinds within that lucid dreaming, you know, spontaneous dreaming, dream incubation, mm -hmm. right? Those are all different ways that scientists solve problems, that we solve through personal or social situations. And the idea of the class is to expose students to many kinds of thinking. Okay, so after they see those 140 plus, then we, we choose some to, to work on. Typically, that runs from topics that are rigorous and philosophical or mathematical, like, you know, quantum logic or skepticism. You'd be surprised how little STEM students might really understand the origins and use of skepticism, like as a practice. So they actually become better scientists and engineers. Mm -hmm. And it goes all the way to things like, you know, shamanism, getting into poetic states, doing holotropic breath work to experience an altered state without needing to take a substance, you know, things like that. And they find it transformative, it transforms their life. So, for example, I, I had a student who was a civil engineer who ended up becoming, you know, an urban planner and reinventing the, you know, concept of cities. Okay. I had a student one who... one of my favorite things, by the way. I actually, <laughs> I spent a period of time in shared space work. So I was a community uh -huh. animator and my job was in a shared space to facilitate connection between all of the disparate, seemingly disparate, of course, organizations who were in the building and to find those connections and help facilitate work between them so that they could create more holistic solutions to, at that building, global poverty. But... I was interfacing so often with the local city here in Denver that I started to see, of course, that cities are incredible grounds for synthesis sorts of work because they are intersections of transportation, housing, education, right? So all of the ways that humanity lives and exists happen in a city, which is like a condensed little Petri dish of right. how we can start asking questions about my question coming out of it a lot was like, how would you build the perfect city? Which perfect is a little, you know, was really just a driving, not the actual goal. But I came out of that really questioning cities and I got into Jane Jacobs and city planning. You know, Jane Jacobs is the infamous city planner in New York who fought Moses about development as New York was coming to be what it is today. And so I started to dive into all of these things around cities. And so I find city planning really fascinating, if anything, because they're in such sort of a relatively small scale that when you start to pull on one thing, it easily starts to affect all of the other things, right? right? So food and housing. And if you do something in food, that it can start to affect housing and yes. transportation, right? So I thought that was really fascinating. One of my favorite people in complexity science is Louis Betancourt, who was at the Santa Fe Institute when I originally met him and started out as a quantum many-body physicist like me. And now he actually does urban planning, University of Chicago. He has a big institute there because um, he discovered some of the scaling laws about how cities grow, mm -hmm. you know, through, through complexity science. Scaling laws is one of our standard techniques. You know, as you said, you know, something changes here, something changes over there. Maybe right. it's food or housing or, you know, happiness or some other form of well-being. And he really started to understand those relationships, be able to even predict them for, uh, you know, certainly the urban landscape in America. So... Now, it's another example of how synthesis is really important, but you wouldn't be able to do that if you didn't have all of the careful engineers and social scientists gathering all of the data, right? Without right. the data, it's like it's like Newton doesn't happen without, you know, Tycho Brahe, right? So, right. you know, or, right. or Kepler for that matter. So, you know, there is that stir, that interplay over and over. Right, the and specialist and the generalist yes, back and forth, Yes, yeah, yeah right? exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I was mentioning that students through this class, they, they do things like, like Betancourt, 
Um, another example is I, I have a student who, you know, started off in physics, got interested in, in AI and, and now does, you know, human robot interactions, you know, and that's pretty far from physics actually in the world of STEM. Mm -hmm. And that happened by going through classes like mine. And so uh, there are many career changes actually that happen in these courses, because as you discover yourself, you discover that there are things that you just never heard of that, that, you know, pique your curiosity and, and do involve more of that kind of thinking where you put things together. Right. I mean, I find that folks who are more synthesis types of people also tend to be ones that change careers many times mm -hmm. over the course of their lives because they are constantly seeing the connections between different things and are infinitely curious. So, you know, maybe at 45, you start to get into something like painting or, you know, soil degradation or something. And you start to see those overlaps, right? Yeah. And that's part of what I love about that book that I quoted from earlier, Range, from David Epstein, because he talks about the way that synthesizers tend to also sort of hit their, not necessarily a peak, but they tend to be relatively successful sort of later in their careers than, than specialists because oh, that's interesting. they're doing all of this synthesizing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes it's not completely across, you know, they're not working across a million different things necessarily. Sometimes it is just a couple of different main areas of expertise. Like sometimes they do really specialize in something, but they do tend to change careers. And so in those leaps can start to draw more of those uh, connections, but later in their lives can often be when they're published or find some sort of innovation at the center of those things because they've done all this sort of underlying work or worked alongside other people who are doing domain specific specialization who are gathering the data like you were talking about. Yes, when you're doing that kind of work, it's very easy to be too far ahead. And then people really don't have any idea what you're saying. There just isn't a community, you know, to, in, in which to discuss your ideas. Right. And uh, uh, it, it doesn't, you know, as I've hopefully emphasized already, it doesn't make you any smarter. It's just a different kind of thinker. But those kinds of thinkers, you know, the rest of the folks won't really know what you're talking about. You know, and then some years later, it becomes clear. And so a lot of times, you know, you have all this building time toward, you know, the fruition of your idea. For example, I have something that's being done um, now at, at Google on the quantum computer there. And uh, that's a kind of set of ideas I built over like seven years. And just barely now is it getting some kind of community acceptance. Right. And, and uh, I think it's really transformative work. And a lot of the smart people I know do, like one of the founders of quantum computing thinks that, you know. But it is true that, you know, for five years, people had no idea really what I was getting at. <laughs> so, you, you know, the other thing is you when you're that kind of thinker, you, you have to be a little bit arrogant in a way. And I mean, that in the most positive sense, you know, you need to really believe in yourself. Right. And so there's a kind of arrogance where, you know, you, you put other people down and that, that's a, that's a kind of low intelligence. And I had that when I was very young. In fact, I was plagued by it. it took me a long time to overcome it. Um, and perhaps I still suffer from it sometimes, but there's another kind of arrogance, which we might call pride in yourself. And, and that's where you, you kind of believe that what you're doing is va valuable or meaningful and you believe in your own ideas. I, I call it listening to the muse, actually. You know, you have a conversation mm -hmm. with the muse and you believe what the muse is telling you. Sure. Not what society is telling you right. or what's popular in research or in art or whatever area you're in. And uh, believing in yourself is important. I do like a balance between things that sit well with society doing kind of the bread and butter of research and then the part that, you know, is rather radical and is definitely not going to get grant funding anytime right. soon. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, a lot of that made me think of uh, uh, several different things, but I'll, most of them are associated with Disney. <laughs> really? <laughs> Which is that, I think you mentioned this a second ago, actually when we were off recording, we were talking about soil degradation and the future of food security, and you said something about not, accounting for innovations in technology yes. and how that will likely change whatever timeline we're looking at Absol or, absolutely it will. or what kinds of uh, innovations or solutions that we mm -hmm. come up with. And that is a hundred percent. I mean, the story of Disney, Ed Cap Mule, who I think started Pixar, founded Pixar. Uh, and he, he has a book where he talks about basically the, they had to invent technology to create the original Star Wars. Right. The technology didn't really exist for them to tell the types of stories that they did. And I think often is sort of intersecting with your point about at an individual level, the way that we have to have a self-belief that 
our gifts and what we're doing in the world has a place, uh, that sometimes the technology just doesn't exist yet, that we're, we're really working in this timeline that we don't necessarily see. And sometimes it's not us who are, are inventing the technology. And so sometimes that we have to wait for things in the general culture or universe to come around to the point where whatever gift we have actually applies really well to, to what's, what's relevant and what's coming up in the world. Yeah, I think it's a balance between humility and foolishness. <laughs> and so foolish is future technology will save me from all my problems. Right. You know, uh, it doesn't matter if I, you know, set off nuclear bombs, you know, all over my country because I will find some way to, you know, remediate radiation, you know. And there really are fundamental physical limits that prevent that from happening at a fast enough rate, like a half-life, okay? <laughs> sure. And so, you know, foolishness is, oh, we'll just solve our energy problems because we'll just invent some new form of energy. Everything will be fine. You know, oh, we'll just go to space and live on another planet, you know. And it's not that we shouldn't dream of those things, but just imagining that all technology will save us, that's the foolishness part. The humility part is the part where I say, well, for example, as a physicist, 95% of the universe is dark matter and dark energy, and we don't really know what it is. So how can I take too seriously my ideas about the 5%, right? Mm -hmm. Or even my speculations about the 95%. It's the same with complexity science where I work. You know, we really don't have any idea of why complexity happens. That's everything from the human brain to ecologies, you know, to even complex materials, to cave formations. I mean, it's very... Uh, huge hole in human knowledge. I, I call it the two century problem, right? It's, it's, it's as big as dark matter and dark energy. You know, why is life around? Yeah, we can always trace backward, but uh, like teleologically, we can trace backward from where we are to the stars, but we can't like take some stars and predict, you know, people or life or even DNA, none of that. So right. I think uh, that's a kind of humility and it's a humility, it's, it's epistemology, right? And in philosophy, but it's a humility about the limits of our knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that with, with that humility, um, I try not to take my ideas too seriously, but I also have to believe in them. So it's that sort of balance, you know. So the idea that, for example, you mentioned food security, you know, will the landscape for, um, you know, food security change? I mean, for sure. Right. I mean, just think about GMO, you know, it saved more lives than any other technology in human history. Right. Uh, I don't think when people invented GMO, they imagined it would also be used for monocropping and destroying the land. I think they thought it would be used, you know, for creating like nutritious rice, which is how it was first used, you know. And so it's hard to predict where technology will go. It's hard to predict when it will happen. But the one thing we know is that whatever we know now, is uh, it's very hard to know what will happen in the future. So we should not limit our imagination, you know, by present knowledge. That's why I don't like science to limit philosophy too much. Mm. I think it's a mistake. I think we're a little bit too in love with science, actually. And I say that like as a scientist who loves science, but I, I think that's an error. Yeah, I, I've been joking recently, especially in this last year, 2020 and 2021, for particular reasons of what's just going on, I think, in the U.S. and our culture, but it's just that you can, you can turn anything into a religion if you try hard enough. <laughs> and I think, you know, but coming, going back to my past and growing up in Texas in the Bible Belt and religious culture and that sort of thing and and all of my history with religion and Christianity and all of those things that I, of course, came out of that going, well, I, I want nothing. <laughs> I want nothing to do with that in the ways that it, at least in the ways that it was taught to me. But then when I started getting into other disciplines and even curious about science, right? Like I, I grew up like you more in the humanities and arts end and never had a particular or skill for science, as far as I knew, until people later in my life told me that I just didn't have great teachers, but I, I could have been a, a fine mathematician or physicist. There's still time. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I, I came out of that going, okay, what do I want to keep from this and what do I not want to keep? But when I started looking into science, it very quickly became a place where I realized all of the ways that I could or could not behave, what I should or should not believe you know, and it, it felt in a lot of ways like it could, at least with certain people or certain organizations or things, felt sort of religious and that there were doctrines you had to believe and there were ways to behave that you were supposed to behave, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm with you that I think a balance is necessary that in some regard, dogma and doctrines are really important and they guide us to things 
that we want to be guided to, but when they become, there's a quote from, I think it's Arrival, the movie, which I feel like if you haven't seen has to be one of your, or have seen, probably it's one of your favorites too, but I love Arrival. And I, uh, there's a quote where she says something, the lead character said something about how language can either be a tool or a weapon. And I, I think that a lot about the disciplines that we get into, that this can be an incredible tool, but wielded without care can become a weapon. Yes, it's one of my favorite films. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's always true of tech. And so pe people imagine that it's, uh, it's immoral to invent something that's used badly. That's not true. It's immoral to use something badly. So, you know, that the, that's why actually ethics is a separate issue from science, but they are, uh, you know, Inter intertwined. interwoven. Yeah, exactly. Intertwined. Right. So and I don't think you can do science without, without learning ethics, but doing science doesn't make you good at ethics. Right. <laughs> Any more than being or an technology. ethicist makes you good at science, you know? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Right. That it's not, it's not immoral to create something that turns out being used for bad, but it, it's worth asking a lot of people in order to build it well, as much as you can, I suppose. Right. What I want to say too about your class though, is also just recounting back to you my own experience of that class, which is at the time I was in a full-time job and this class was on Wednesday nights from six to 10 PM. <laughs> I think at the time I was 36 years old and for all intents and purposes, that would have been wild to anybody to, I had to get off of work at five o'clock in the middle of a work week, drive across town, which is about a 30 to 40 minute drive for me from Denver to, to golden, sit in a four hour class and then come home. And on paper, like I said, that looks wild. I was exhausted always going into the class on a Wednesday night, halfway through my work week at a job I didn't necessarily love, but was still good at, like it was how I made money. I would leave, I would eat dinner and I would get in my car to drive here. And the whole time in traffic, I would just think, why don't you just go home and sleep <laughs> <laughs> or do laundry or something else that an adult needs to do. Right. And I would sit down when I would get to class and 10 minutes in the thing I love. And I mentioned this in the interview that I did with Shannon. I was telling her part of the story too, Shannon Davies Mankus that in the beginning of class, you would have these students of yours read their narrative writing mm -hmm. uh, just as an opening exercise. At, well, after meditation, of course. So we would start with a few minutes of meditation and then you would have students read these writings that they had done for their weekly homework assignments. And for sure by student one, but definitely by the second or third student that would read, I had literally so much energy it was so hard to be, number one, a silent student as an auditing student. And number two, not just truly get up, shake my desk, and run around the classroom. And I felt myself so often wanting to just look over at these students and go, number one, do you realize how brilliant you are? I, because that's some of the best writing I've ever heard. And number two do you realize how lucky you are? Like this, this environment doesn't exist everywhere. So to get opportunities to explore different ways of thinking in this way and to really lean into that and to your creativity and how your engineering and your math can also be creative is so lucky. I, I would have given anything to have this when I was 20. 21. Oh, me too. It didn't exist where I was. Right. Yeah. yeah. I was in a, you know, state university, UC Berkeley. And the, if it existed, I certainly didn't know about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think they know the second, they, they feel very lucky to be there, but they don't realize the first. And part of my job right. is to teach them that they teach them their own brilliance and, and elicit it, allow, you know, give it the right ingredients. Create so can, the environment mm -hmm. where it can flourish. Yeah, right? exactly. So like a lot of them had not even written a poem since high school. Sure. You know, so uh, to really be writing poetry and fall in love with poetry and experience that love relationship that happens with a poet or some poems or a theme in poetry motif, um, that, that, that's a transformative experience for students like that. Uh, they, they many times 
write poems for many years after and submit to poetry magazines and send me their poetry. And so it really has an impact on them. And it shows that if you, you know, you kind of give someone a chance to try something out, a lot of times they'll, they'll discover themselves. Yeah. I mean, when, when I was waiting for you outside your door before starting this interview, I was looking at your door, which is covered with a, a, a bunch of their uh, zine projects, uh -huh. which is a final project yeah. of yours and just looked at you and went, what a cool job you have. I mean, <laughs> how amazing to get to see these students have that sort of transformation. But how did you get into poetry? Because that's how I originally sort of know of you, I feel like, which I thought of you more like the quantum physics plus poetry guy. So where did poetry show up in your life? Other than, of course, like you said, sort of reading as a child. But I, I think you mentioned at some point spoken word also, right? Oh, yeah. I've done that for decades. So, well, <laughs> uh, I had two full-time professional parents. And so I wasn't quite a latchkey kid, but something close to that. I had yeah. a lot of time on my hands. Yeah. Uh, my parents didn't believe in TV, which was a big favor to me. So there really wasn't a lot to do other than my parents' books and my own inventions. And I, I really was sort of in, in, enraptured by the ideas that came to me. And so I was doing my own science experiments. I was writing poems. I was doing those kinds of things from the time I was a young child. So I would wander around writing poetry in elementary school. I mean, that, that started as early as that. And, uh, and then in, in high school, I joined actually a writing group which was really, really helpful if any, any writer will tell you that. Once you get into a writing group, then you, it really takes off, you know. There's something about the synergy just like that class of being around writers and and, and the kind of thinking that writers engage in. Right. Um, and, yeah, it just became a lifestyle where I would write every day. I mean, I have my whole life, so. Mm -hmm. About spoken word, um, <laughs> that's just part of living in Seattle and, you know, wearing an overcoat and, you know, <laughs> generally being cool. In I a mean, particular generation, yeah, especially, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it just kind of happened. I think, you know, at, at that time, people were really feeling that uh, page poetry was a dead art form. And so young people invented, you know, slam and, and spoken word really started to take on more of a slam aspect, probably inspired in great part by hip hop, but many things. And, uh, and so if you're living in Seattle at that time, you know, it's, it's, it's raining most of the time. Well, we won't call it raining. It's drizzling. Sure. <laughs> Dreamily most of the time. It's right. not like you're, it's not like Texas where you're soaked. Right. So you're wandering around in the rain, you know, the rain, on you. like beating your hair, you know, and it's very romantic and there are used bookstores in every corner and, uh, there are cafes everywhere. And so people are reading in the cafes and, uh, it's, it's that kind of environment. So I had the great fortune to go to graduate school in, in Seattle and uh, the environment of being in Seattle, including queer culture, as we were discussing earlier, mm -hmm. um, you know, had a lot of impact on me. And that, you know, alternative culture, alternative musical culture, queer culture, poetry culture, like engaging in that, um, you know, really helped me kind of find myself intellectually. I really blossomed. When something is is pressing on you to, to appear, whether it's a mathematical result or a poem or an invention or something you're going to build or, you know, maybe it's a girl you followed to a party and you just really need to talk to her, right? You know, whatever right. it is, like, like it, it's important to listen to yourself. And so a lot of poetry is learning to listen to yourself, learning to listen to your own heart, learn to listen to the muse, right? And expressing those things. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a need. And, it, and uh, the issue with the exhaustion is that society keeps us so busy. Well, we allow society to keep us so busy that then we can't uh, hear ourselves, you know? Right. So a lot of the class is to get students to make space to listen to themselves. You said how we start with meditation. Actually, I called it silence because I didn't want it to seem religious or spiritual in nature per se. It really was just five minutes totally. of silence. Some people would choose meditation, other people, other things. We used an hourglass, so there's no tech, uh, very simple tech or older mm -hmm. tech, you know, no, no modern electronic tech. And just, just having five minutes of silence, actually, they found transformative, they would tell me. Like they just never took five minutes to just listen. It's so rare. Yeah. And once they did that, of course, the writing started appearing. So, you know, you, you self-actualize when you listen to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I actually today saw a post on Instagram from a friend of mine who is a poet, Tara Shea Burke, who is talking about just sort of reflecting for herself all, all the ways that her mind got caught up and trying to write something meaningful as a caption and then realized halfway through that all of the work she's so she was sort of, uh, I don't think she used the word wasting, but all, all, all of the work she was doing, spending in her mind, thinking about what she could write there was actually keeping her from her creativity. And there was a line toward the end I loved that she said something about how she's begun to realize what the use of really good boundaries is in its creative expression. That when you actually draw enough boundaries and silence for yourself, mm -hmm. that 
you know, uh, I think if I'm sort of mirroring back what you said, that like there's just so much noise in culture constantly in the way that society is built that we don't often take that pause so that uh, I often have the experience of going, well, I, I just don't even know that I hear myself anymore. I feel like a lot of times I'm just reflecting back or repeating stuff that other people are saying. And so I'm completely missing out on this well of creativity and the stuff that is actually buried in me that would like to be birthed in the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I love that you start that class with silence. I think it's so, as I'm sure you see, like foundational, actually creating the space toward opening that kind of river of opportunity up. Quantum logic plus exclusive truth is what you were thinking about talking about today. I want to also get into whatever it is that, that you feel like is at the intersection of those two things that is really at the heart of what you're trying to do in the world. I think I got into this topic of the historical antecedents of quantum logic and the ways of thinking when I was in a tomb in Egypt. So I spent uh, about six months after my PhD wandering from Ireland uh, down to Morocco and then across North Africa and, and sort of followed this historical path of people that I, I, I loved in literature and also some of my own ancestors uh, being Jewish, you know. Wow, what an incredible journey. Yeah, and so uh, spent time in Spain and, you know, Netherlands and... And um, so I ended up in Egypt and I, I really fell in love with Egypt and I spent uh, a couple of months there. So at some point I actually engaged in the tourist circuit, which I, I did very little in Egypt. And, and I had the chance to go to the Valley of the Kings and go into the tombs, uh, which many tourists do. It's, it's a wonderful experience. So at the end of the Valley of the Kings is the tomb of Tuthmosis the, the third, And it's the, it's the first written text, tomb text in all of the tombs and in, in fact, really in, in history, a text written out like that. So it's called the Amduat, it's called the Book of the Hidden Chamber. And I think when I saw that text, it, it really struck me. You know, you, you, you think of a book as something you turn pages on, but that's not how it started. It started as a kind of a, a story painting that went around a wall. Mm -hmm. And you see this also in old, old Chinese paintings, mm -hmm. rather like a graphic novel, actually. Hmm. It's an art form I love to engage in and teach. Mm -hmm. So in this tomb, the Book of the Hidden Chamber, every god exists within within every other god so there's this concept of of you know everything containing everything else and it's it's what i would call complexity thinking you know mm -hmm. um, it's very common in complexity sciences that this occurs and it's quite different from the sorts of philosophy that i had studied in in graduate school i went through the whole western canon you know starting with uh the pre-Socratics and then sort of working my way forward to modern times and it's it's a great canon i learned a lot from it but it does end up mostly in the realm of binary logic Binary logic is, you know, as you know, is, you know, true and false, black mm -hmm. and white, gay and straight, Zero you know, <laughs> right, yeah. right. So, you know, we all, we all understand that, that, you know, it's, it's powerful because it's what powers computers, but it's also a limited way of thinking, you know, as our ethical thinking uh, evolves during our own lifetimes. I mean, we, we encounter shades of gray and we start to understand shades mm -hmm. of gray. Things aren't so black and white as people say. And so going beyond that, binary thinking is very important for our own personal development, seeing that, you know, like the uh, height of literature of this foundational civilization was completely non non binary, mm. <laughs> really struck me. And I kind of got into the whole story of how all these texts occurred. And there are many math proofs in the tombs, and they don't use binary thinking either. They don't use exclusive logic. Wow. Yeah. So I one of my embarrassing 14 books is uh, called Egypt and it's 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 a book of poetry written about the Amduat it's a poetic novella the book of the hidden chamber and uh so if you ever go to the Egypt and the Valley of the Kings go see it there's also a traveling exhibit which came many years later uh, to Denver and travels all around the world and it's put together by an Egyptologist and a Jungian psychologist and it uses that text and recreates the entire tomb. So you have the, the visceral experience of walking wow. to that tomb. That tomb is so powerful that some of the most brilliant synthesis in the world have put together an exhibit that everyone can participate in without flying to Egypt, but not a virtual exhibit, one where you're physically in there. The only difference is when you're in the Egyptian experience, like in Egypt, it's extremely humid. And so your body is just soaking Damp. and it's, it's like being in a, you know, in a sauna or something, yeah. you know, cause it's incredibly hot and dry outside, but underneath because of the Nile, it's very damp. Sure. And so there is like a somatic component to yeah. experiencing, you know, this, this non-exclusive like kind of truth. It's like a thick 
Yes. Air. Yes. So you yes. feel like you're almost swimming in it. That's right. That's right. So and and you're coming out of extreme dry heat in the Sahara down into that deep underground. And getting in there is a narrow shaft, and you know it's all quite an experience. It's, all an experience. it's like yeah. spelunking, you know, spelunking for truth. So, <laughs> the so, name of our next uh, album cover. Yeah, sounds yeah. great. Yeah, we got, we got <laughs> it right now. Truth. We just need the band name, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that book and working through that book, I read it every day for a year and developed this book of poetry by accident. They're actually my margin notes that turned out to be a book. I was shocked. Um, that whole experience got me really interested in the history of, of quantum mechanics. And I had thought that quantum mechanics was sort of invented in the 1920s. Quantum mechanics does involve this kind of non-exclusive truth. For example, the Schrodinger cat is both alive and dead. You sure. alluded to Schrodinger earlier. Things are both here and there. If you know a little chemistry, things are both in the S and the P orbital at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. they have different shapes at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that, that idea that, that, you know, things aren't exclusive that is one of the foundations of quantum. And, and, and I, I really enjoyed going through the history of that, not only sort of the very preliminary ideas in complexity type thinking, as I personally call it in the Egyptian, Egyptian tomb texts and many other resources, but also actually in the pre-Socratics. So, so Pira was thinking about this fourfold logic. It's funny, I, I was, I'm moving at the moment and I was going through my old journals and I found something from graduate school from long before I went to Egypt in which I wrote out the fourfold logical system but with ever having read Pyrrho, you know, I said, mm. you know, that which is, that which is not, that which both is and is not, that which neither is nor is not, right? Mm. And it sounds like some kind of spiritual thing, you know, mm -hmm. and it sort of is, you know, I mean, uh, that's not maybe how Pyrrho thought about it, but it was a way of doing logic before binary logic, before Aristotle really codified and solidified our current kind of logical thinking. Mm. This fourfold logic turns out to be four points on the sphere of possibility that is the basis of the quantum bit. <laughs> so they're actual mathematical, what? right? They're actual mathematical objects. So people, you know, more or less 500 years um, before Christ, you know, we're, we're thinking about uh, for, you know, something like quantum logic. And, and a little later in, in Buddhism, one of the foundational thinkers in Buddhism, Nagarjuna has, if, if, if you know some Buddhism, has something called the fourfold way. And the fourfold way is exactly that fourfold non-binary logic. So I like that quantum logic takes these ideas that came really before binary logic for most civilizations and are probably a very natural way of thinking. Like me as a young person, I was thinking that way, never having been exposed to it. I'm not the only one. Many people, many mm -hmm. cultures think that way. Kids think in paradox. Mm -hmm. It's very normal. They don't like thinking. It's very uncomfortable thinking binary logic. We think it's natural now, but only because after, you know, uh, 10 or 20 years of schooling, it, it gets ingrained into us, but it's not natural at all. Mm. So uh, in the end, what, what, what quantum logic shows is that those states that are between true and false, they're not just anything goes. They're an actual mathematical object. Mm. And that mathematical object is a latitude and a longitude on a sphere of possibility where the poles, the north and the south, you remember this from the class, mm -hmm. and you pr I promise not to get too too <laughs> professorial here, but I have to just say this piece, then you, you can you can stop me if I get carried away. So the north and the south poles are this 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 exclusive possibilities, and there are these two angles between. And I, I, I really do like that that opens up another way of thinking uh, mm -hmm. for me and, and for many people. And I also like that that many people throughout the, the years have come up with these ideas, but we've refined them and made them even better. So yeah. I like that we're coming back to these, you know, ancient ways of thinking so-called, right. but we're doing them even better. How many other ways of thinking are there that were invented by much earlier human beings that can now be re-examined and rethought and turned into just, you know, mine for gold or diamonds or, you know, something pretty extraordinary. Yeah, completely. Mm -hmm. At School of Mines, I had to mention mining, by the way, somewhere in this podcast. So, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. We will mention School of Mines over and over again just to make sure <laughs> they're getting the credit they're due. Okay. Uh, there is one thing, just from a personal perspective, I want to talk to you about more. We brought up earlier liminal thinking and dreaming. I would love just to hear you riff on that because where did you get into practicing? And, and, and almost, I love how you were talking about that for you, things like journaling and meditation and stories later at night, right, are things that seem to prime your brain yes. to think about physics mm -hmm. during your day. And so how, how and when did you start using liminal thinking, uh, dreaming, dream states, those sorts of things to engage with your work or to think creatively or open your brain or how, whatever purpose it is that you do it for? I have the great benefit of having two parents who have PhDs in psychology, as I mentioned. And so I grew up telling my dreams 
all of us telling our dreams at the dinner table every night. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. So no way. Yeah. So I was engaging in, you know, dream thinking from an early age and taking dreams quite seriously and not in the sense of this symbol means that, but sure. more like, you know, a dream is a, is a way to unlock yourself a way A dream is a way to, you know, work through something in some in inner simulation. A dream is a way to have a spiritual experience, you know, those kinds of ideas. And a dream is a way to listen to yourself as we mentioned earlier. So I was always listening to my dreams from a very young age. In fact, I can remember when I was uh, five years old, I was having nightmares as many children four to six do for separation anxiety and, um, and individuation. It's very important, you know, key. It's a key time in development of children. And my mother was a child psychologist. Let me boast about my mother for a moment. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Please do. I actually have six moms, but this, this is my bio mom. Okay. So, okay. so my, my bio mom, uh, got a PhD in child psychology when the discipline did not exist. She invented the, you know, the idea. She did a sort of independent, self-guided PhD and eventually became child psychology. And uh, she also invented uh, sandbox therapy, not as a way to, you know, help people, but as a way to show evidence in the court of what a preverbal child is going through so the child gets placed in the right home right. as a child advocate with the court system. And so I, I, and she's just a pretty tremendous person and really, really brilliant, absolute misanthrope, but somehow loved, you know, the, the children and child psychology. Sure. And, uh, tell us her name so that we make sure oh, to include her. Sure. Yeah. Her name's uh, Mary Tall. Mary mm -hmm. Tall. All right. Mary Courtney Tall. Yeah. And I, I grew up calling her mom. Sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, As one does. Uh, and so I, I really had the benefit of having someone who, you know, had a deep knowledge of dreams, both from the, you know, personal perspective, but also from, you know, the educational perspective of being a psychologist. And then, you know, really use them with young children in, in, in her work and not just to, you know, help children with their, like, personal difficulties or family issues, which is also very important, but also to really save children from very, very bad and traumatic situations. And so, um, you know, uh, that, that was very inspirational to me as a young kid. Um, so I, I got involved with dreaming early on. I think I, I was reading Jung pretty thoroughly um, by about age 10 and, and just before that Freud. And so they were very involved with dreams. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, following on that, I got really, really involved in dreaming and at some point made it part of my spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And so uh, all of that led to dreams, you know, naturally being a place where I, I did, you know, science. Um, I think in graduate school, I would have dreams like uh, I would be dreaming of mathematics, but I wouldn't really be writing mathematics. I really would just be mathematics. So in my dreams, there really wasn't any identity, but I would experience math kind of from the inside. And that really helped with my research. And, you know, I did mathematical physics for my PhD. So I find that very incredible. I am a person who doesn't often remember their dreams. And I think instilling that as a practice early on. I, I, I'm a big believer though, that like when you do practice actually remembering them, journaling mm -hmm. them, perhaps when you wake up or I have friends who will wake up and record their voice on a voice memo, right. just talking about their dreams as a way to remember what happened and engage with them there. But I've, I haven't often been a person who remembers what they dream. And so as as a later adult, I've been trying to engage with that and see if I can build that capacity. You, you can. Which I believe is possible. Absolutely. Completely. And, and, you know, abilities in, in transferring short to long-term memory vary person to person. So, like, I remember seven or eight dreams a night if I focus. But, you know, it didn't start that way. It started with a few. So, but everybody, everybody can do that. Everybody can do that kind of thinking. In fact, most kinds of thinking everyone can do. It's a matter of what do you want to invest in? Do you want to invest in being a quantum physicist? Do you want to invest in being, you know, a person who remembers and pays attention to their dreams? Do you want to invest in being an athlete? You know, you, you, mm -hmm. you actually can't do everything, but you can do many things in life. And, mm -hmm. uh, that's the important thing is that growth mindset. Yeah. My, uh, my younger son's name is uh, Hanim, which in Arabic means dreamer. So mm -hmm. I'm really very involved with dreams to the very point of naming it. my son. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah, it's right. a deeply personal endeavor mm -hmm. to you. Like you said, a spiritual practice. Yes. I find that to be true also. Okay, so who who are these sort of synthetic, as you refer to them, synthesis thinkers that you can remember maybe throughout your younger adulthood or in general who might have inspired you to go, I, I call them, and again, I take this from an, another podcast, but like a possibility model. So who, who showed you that this way of thinking was possible, uh, even though you were already doing it clearly when you were a, a small human? And then have there been ways 
that you have felt really, you know, I think we've talked about queer culture or alternative thinking or having to have self-belief because you don't necessarily fit in other places, mm-hmm. but, but places where you have felt like you didn't belong necessarily or if you've received pushback for being the kind of person who jumps around in this way. Yes. So I mentioned my parents, of course, and uh, they had an intellectual circle around them. And uh, like many uh, intellectuals, uh, I had the benefit of, of inspirational figures around me my entire life. That's generally true of intellectuals. They don't kind of come from nowhere, right? Sure. They don't often come from school, which is an interesting question about what's going on with education. Huh. But they do come from, you know, personal education through some circle of friends. You know, Einstein famously was spending a lot of time with a philosopher, uh, an uncle of his, you know, and you can go through the list. Um, so in my case, my earliest memories of people outside my family and perhaps the immediate friends of my parents is third grade. I was lucky enough to be in Washington, D.C. for a year where I was exposed to really world culture because D.C. is such a center for the world. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a a friend I made there who was uh, quite a bit older than me. So I was, I guess, nine and he was probably about 40 at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knew my mother um, and my mother's boyfriend. My parents were divorced at the time. And... uh, uh, we just really got along well, and uh, we began to meditate together and talk. Um, he just passed away this last January. His name is Abdulaziz Said, and he was a professor of what we, I suppose we would call now peace and conflict studies, although he wouldn't agree with the conflict part. Mm. Um, and uh, he, he really uh, was a synthesist, a polymath, if you wish, um, someone who, who took ideas from many fields and put them together and created you know world peace. And one of the things he would do is he would never take money for any of his consulting and peace negotiations, and that kept everything very clean. Uh, he worked with most heads of state throughout the Middle East. I think his father was president of Syria for like one day before they fled the country, you know. he was wow. <laughs> so. But he came over when he was quite young and then really became very involved with the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King. And uh, when I met him, he was such an advanced person already. So I, I had the benefit of over 40 years of education through knowing Abdulaziz Said, for example. Another person was my third grade teacher, actually, named Mrs. Beale. And so she discovered that I was good at math. Mm. She discovered that I was very, very good at math. So she kept giving me more and more advanced mathematical assignments up through middle and into high school. And I just kept doing them. And she was the kind of teacher who at the same time was working with a student who couldn't tell time, you know, in third grade to not be able to read a clock is kind of limiting, right? Mm -hmm. At that time, you know, digital clocks were not so common. I'm old enough where it was mostly analog clocks (laughs) around. Yeah. You know, and when I remember when everyone, okay, so, so she worked with each student, you know, at whatever level they were at and kind of tailored her teaching. So she really inspired me. And, you know, is that a polymath? I don't know. It is someone who really listens and listens to different kinds of people. And I I think both Abdaziz Said and Mrs. Beale were great listeners and that inspired me. Mm -hmm. And I remember when the student could finally read the clock, he read it aloud in the class and, you know, all 25 of us applauded, you know, and I was, she was as proud of him for reading the clock as she was of me for doing, you know, high school math in third grade. And, um, I learned a lot from people like that. So these were people that had interpersonal development as much as they knew things intellectually. And I think that that, that, that's a more of an inspiration than just knowledge on its own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love to just the, I was thinking, you know, in your class, there was, um, Rodinsky. I don't know if I'm saying, I'm remembering that right. That's the the one that had the 140 plus kinds of thinking. Alex Gordinsky is a friend of mine, philosopher. Yeah. So the... The ways of thinking, the ways of listening. Mm-hmm. So you're talking mm-hmm. about these two people in your lives as being like the different ways that they were listening for that around them also. And yeah, I, I love all of that, that they're all just sort of different languages. And like you said, that you sort of choose whichever languages you want to focus on in your life because you can't do them all. But that, that there are different ways of seeing or listening which I, I feel like is one of the great things that you offer to your students in terms of opening that sort of chasm wider to say, well, you think this way, but what about this? You know, and having them practice that. Yeah, Abdaziz would, would say uh, that science is my paradigm and that, you know, his paradigm was Sufism and that whatever your paradigm is, you know, live your paradigm. And mm-hmm. so from that, I understood to live science more thoroughly in all parts of my life. 
a lot of scientists stop being a scientist when they're not in the lab. And I think that's a mistake because mm -hmm. science involves humility and involves the idea that the data is sacred and then our interpretation can change in any moment. Science involves listening, listening to people, listening to the data. You know, uh, those are those are important parts of how I live my life. Mm -hmm. You're also really, there's been a couple of things that you've said that really make me think uh, actually about Judaism. I don't come from a Jewish background, but I do love everything I've heard in terms of sort of the ancient oral tradition, what it would be to study your ancestors and then the privilege of chewing that over and then passing that forward. And then those people chewing that over and passing that forward, right? So that there's just this lineage of thought that we get the privilege of engaging with and sort of dancing with, right? And, and, yeah. and I think that's how I think of this sort of work that like when you're like the ability to not just sort of double down on one thing, but to like have a comfort with dancing in these different places and in these ways and engaging with them. And that it feels like an honor to engage with generations of previous work. So to Eisenstein, the all of the great thinkers, you know, that, that we get to study and then do our work and build on top of. Right. That we're, mm -hmm. that it's not necessarily a, an end goal to get anywhere, but we're, we're part of a long lineage of thought. That's really fun. Yeah. You, you, you talked about finding your place as a, as a synthesis or a polymath and it is difficult. It's very difficult, but you find your place in, in that history actually. Mm -hmm. So even though, you know, I couldn't even talk with my teachers about what I was thinking and certainly up through high school, I knew more than what most of my teachers were teaching. I could read somebody like Jung and be in awe and feel that I was having a conversation with Jung, even if it was just me learning from Jung, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that that kind of experience of being able to really engage with the community of intellectuals over the ages, I mean, every single intellectual that is, you know, a generalist, as you said, they will they will tell you that that's the saving grace. Without that, I think I think we we might not make it. You know, mm. because there is a lot of rejection from society and not so much now because I know how to talk to people and I'm also a better listener now, you know, and I'm better at appreciating different kinds of, of uh, intelligences. Mm -hmm. But certainly when I was a kid, I mean, I had no understanding of that, you know, like a lot of uh, exceptional kids. I was twice exceptional, which means I was differentially developed, which means there were parts of me that were pretty stunted, you know, and some of them were social. And I think, you know, having the chance to really learn from those great thinkers over the years. And once in a while to meet someone like Abdaziz Saeed um, really, really changed my life. So thank God for books. <laughs> thank God for books. Yeah. I also, I don't know, a lot of that feels, uh, you know, to go really spiritual with it, just like also sort of a lived active prayer that like you're, you're engaging with a text, a person who in the past has had thought that you're now diving into and that you're, you're creating a dialogue back and forth with them, even though they're not present, right? Yes. That's what happened with the Amduat, the book of the hidden chamber I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. from the tomb text. I spent a year reading it. I knew it would be very important for me. And in, in the year of reading that every day, every morning, a book appeared of my own. And that book is uh, my favorite book I've written so far, for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I was changed by engaging with that text. And, you know, I don't know who the scribe was who wrote that down. It's definitely in somebody's handwriting. <laughs> right. Someone did it. Yeah. Someone exceptional. And uh, what, what, a, what a gift to be able to engage in that. Mm -hmm. What a gift for sure. Well, I think that's a great place to end for us as it has certainly been an honor, a gift to be both introduced to your work and be in that class as an auditing older student and to get to continue in conversation with you as part of this lineage. I, I just, I'm so thrilled by, of course, continually. So thank you for your time. And yeah, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. I've listened to that episode probably six times total, maybe even more. And I love it every time I go back and listen to it. So I hope you feel the same. Um, a few quick notes, just as corrections or follow up after that conversation. I mentioned someone named Moses when Lincoln and I were talking about city planning. I was referring to Robert Moses. And when looking him up online, I found a piece on untappedcities.com that described him this way. Quote, he was one of the most influential and controversial figures in the history of New York City's growth and decay. In his day, Moses was an urban planner associated with many of the capital projects we still see today throughout the five boroughs. 
However, his legacy is checkered due to biased policies and negative criticism, despite the fact that he helped take the city out of the Great Depression. I'll link to that piece, uh, that article in the show notes, but it's called Five Things in NYC We Can Blame on Robert Moses. <laughs> um, also, Ed Catmule co-founded Pixar and was also the president of Walt Disney Animation Studios. The book I refer to of his is called Creativity Inc., and I still love it so much. Um, possibility models is an idea that comes from the call your girlfriend podcast. I've referenced that before, and I've linked to at least one thing I could find about Schrodinger and his polyamory online in the show notes as well. Super interesting to read. Lincoln doesn't have a real place to find him online, but links to this episode show notes, of course, like I said, and everything we talked about are on my site at this plus that.com slash episodes. Just make sure to find the one on Lincoln and thanks to the team, of course, at Upfire Digital for the audio processing. You can find them online at upfiredigital.com. All of my music is by the folks at slip.stream. Find them online at that same address. I do these interviews from my home on the native land of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho people, and I am still learning how to do this land acknowledgement really well, so that's in process. Uh, but you can otherwise find me online at thisplusthat.com and thisplusthatpod on Twitter and Instagram. I also think you should really email or tweet me or something and tell me all the things that you'd study if you could. I feel like after this episode, I just want to have conversations about all the things. It's like, where would you travel next? Only what would you study next? I feel like for me right now, I'd maybe take like two years off to rest because uh, goodness knows we all need it. Uh, but after that, I feel like I might try cinematography. I've always wanted to do that. After that, uh, maybe I'd go into biodynamic farming. And man, I would just spend forever in classes on just like the sci science fiction of like women of color and what they've taught us about, I don't know, imagining new worlds and futures, sort of like Lincoln talks about in his bio, uh, you know, just what are ways that we can imagine that life might look like afterward. And there's so many incredible women of color who have written on that and taught us science fiction. Also my forever favorite, Ursula K. Le Guin. Basically, I just want to be in lifelong classes studying all of those people. But anyway, if you are a plus kind of person and you love this shit as much as I do, you can sign up for my newsletter at thisplusthat.com. In it, you're going to get inside peeks at important connections I'm making at the intersections of other seemingly unconnected ideas, mostly essays of my own processing my personal experience, and sometimes often just weaving together stuff that I've read or listened to that I find really fascinating. It's also the only place I share recommended reading and listening related to each show and the only place where I take guest recommendations for now. So if you reply to me, you can tell me who you think I should interview. Bonus points and gold stars if you actually know them and can create a connection between us. <laughs> other than that, uh, the other stuff that helps me out, as always, is just to rate and subscribe. Tell other people about the show. Get on my newsletter. Rate the show five stars if you love it and write a review that's really kind and tells me what it's meant to you and why you like this show so far. All right, that's it for this, uh, this episode. I hope you enjoyed that conversation between me and Lincoln and that you're inspired now to go uh, maybe even get into more math if you're not a math person or to go dig into some poetry or go learn more about the mystics. And honestly, this is also... One of the reasons I love uh, encouraging you to be on my newsletter is, again, that like in each in each newsletter where I drop an episode for the podcast, I actually list out related reading that you should go look at, like related reading to the, each particular show. And the related reading for this show is so good. I talk about, I mean, I you know, the show notes also, but like both of those combined together. So things like Einstein's Dreams and Annie Dillard and all kinds of other things that I think you're going to love. So get on the newsletter list, make sure you're digging into all of those like marginalia that I give you and, you know, extra reading when you're just in a moment of pleasure and can be reading more. I hope you enjoy. Thanks everybody.